Hey, that should be working. Alright, so theoretically we are in there. Can someone in chat please confirm, deny, you can hear my voice, you can hear the music. Everything is funky fresh and happy dappy. Doing a mic test. Should be good. We have green things. Again, please, if someone can check, just confirm. Okay, looks like we are coming through loud and clear. Um, let's get it. There we are. We are in there. I apologize. It is things are a little different today. My computer is uh, a bit on the fritz, but we should be all set. We got audio, we got video, we are ready to go. Okay. So, if you are checking, you have done the last quiz, and we're doing three chapters today. Please note that you will have another test on the 21st. Okay. Oh, music's still playing over your voice. Yeah, we got to stop that. Yeah, one thing is, I apologize, I can't hear today because I'm using a different, uh, a different mic. So I appreciate you letting me know about that. I apologize again. So just remember the schedule that I sent you at the beginning of the semester... We're taking care of 37 through 39 today, and then we probably will actually go into 40, so that way we have more time for review, okay? So, um, yeah, 37, 38, 39, 40, and then 41, 42, 43, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Um, we'll see how today's lecture goes. But do know you do have a test 21st, one week from today. Uh, your... Test threes are all graded. All your test threes should be graded. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. But those grades should be public up in Georgia View right now. Okay. Uh, many of you have emailed me about your final projects. Good. Please email me your topics for what you are going to write about for your final project. I will appreciate that. Uh, remember that the due date for those are coming up. Could you put the test in the calendar on Georgia View? Yes, I do. will. I will um, create that test today just so it pops up for you. And it'll be the same thing. I'll open it probably from noon on one day till midnight on the other or midnight till noon. I think I gave you 36 hours last time. Expect the same idea, 36 to 48 hours to complete your test. And again, that one will be online. Should be easy peasy. Okay. And again, yes, because the test was given online, many scores were quite a bit higher. We love to see that. We love high scores. Okay. All right, so here we go. Chapter 37, Popular Music and Jazz to 1950. We're essentially got through the, um, the 19th century or up in the 20th century. So what happened then? Well, popular music before 1850, we had these things called broadsides. Uh, if you remember back in the Renaissance era, they had this tradition of singing madrigals after dinner, right? It was sort of the same things where uh, American families would sing show tunes. Um, so they had these broadsides, which were just a single sheet of paper containing only the words um, for... A popular song right because people just knew the melodies right um, parlor songs were simple sentimental songs just like ballads that sort of thing parlor songs think back to the troubadour tradition um, can and please email me about that and I'll check into it for you after class as far as these sentimental songs we had this guy Stephen Foster there's a picture of him he was the most well-known Remember, we spoke briefly about Stephen Foster um, with Charles Ives' symphony because he quoted the Camptown Races, which was one of those Stephen Foster songs, one of these popular parlor songs. Okay, so if people don't have tests for grade three, then I probably didn't release them. They are in there, though. I'll do that after class. I will check into that for you. Apologies about that. Okay. 
So we do see the continuation of some of the older European traditions. We're getting out popular songs so that the American public can play them together and sing them together. Now this turns into this other industry called Tin Pan Alley. It was essentially the popular music industry that was selling sheet music in New York City. Uh, this was like the 1880s, and it continued through up until World War II, but it was mostly popular in that 1890, 1900, 1910, and about 1920 it sort of slips off in popularity. So Tin Pan Alley is this style. It was literally a place in New York City, but it's the general term for this style of sentimental song, sentimental popular song. Uh, it was essentially the popular music industry before there was, like, popular music, right? This is when radio is just sort of getting, getting more popular. So Tin Pan Alley was capitalizing on the idea that not only could we play and create popular music, but we can also sell it. We can sell the sheet music for people. Uh, again, just like many popular songs, they did a lot of songs. Most of them were short-lived, right? Consider it like, uh, you know, Bodak Yellow. And sometimes you get a Stephen Foster who's like Carly B who sticks around for a little bit, right? It's the same idea. Okay, one of the most popular ideas in the 1980 songs, the way it was, is we have a lead-in and then a verse followed by a chorus with an A, A, B, A, 32 measure form. Okay, this is just sort of the general outline of the Tin Pan Alley song. Um, there were a lot of different ways in which these were put together, but particularly that A A B A with the lead in is the most popular way. So, talking about another popular music form is ragtime. Essentially, it's these these March sounding things for piano, okay? They're in 2 4, which means it's still bass 4, you know, 1 2, 1 2, 1 2, 1 2. It's quick, the melodies are catchy, and there's a lot of syncopation. Remember, if syncopation was one of our first key terms, it means when you put accents off the beat. Like in particular, this one, uh, Maple Leaf Rag. Right, it's that sort of syncopation. Okay, you may have heard of the uh, style of ragtime. Perhaps you have never heard what it sounds like. So why don't I show you that now? And again, Scott Joplin is an extremely important name that you need to know. 100%, absolutely, gotta know it. Most popular ragtime composer of, like, all time. Like, all time? Like, all time. Like, all time? Like, all time. Yeah. Just that important. Hmm... Oh, no. Okay, it looks like we'll just have to get it somewhere else. Cengage is being finicky. Oh, this is wonderful. I apologize for the delay, everyone. I do. Hmm. I do apologize. Hmm. Let's try searching elsewhere. See, this is the problem with doing it live, folks. But see, that's a sad class average, yeah. 
Lots of tomatoes. Lots of tomatoes. I would really like... Uh, so this is just incredible. I have enough to stream to you, but I'm not getting enough to search on YouTube. We will give it a little bit more time. Oh, I have the overlay up too. I apologize about that. that. Okay, there we go. Okay, well, I apologize for the speed of my tech today. Um, you will have to then listen to the maple leaf rag on your own. We will check back in with our internet connection in a little bit. But for now, I will have to ask you to go listen to that in Cengage on your own to get the idea of that style of ragtime, that signature sound. And again, you can look for more by Scott Joplin. Like I said, he was the most important and influential composer of ragtime. Uh, so you will definitely be able to find more stuff by him. Moving on. The blues. Now, the blues is a 100% American musical tradition, right? Blues and jazz and swing are all 100% Americana. Uh, the blues itself, the texts are often about personal hardships, hence the name The Blues, right? I got the blues. It's something that you sing when you feel sad, right? Where was this music created? This music was created by um, African Americans, the poor black people of America who faced a lot of hardships, racial injustice, prejudices, poverty. And so they were singing about their personal experiences in the world. The blues comes from a very personal, introverted place. And so that's how this style got created, right? People say, your blues ain't got no soul. You're, you're singing the blues, but do you know what you're singing? Do you really understand the hardships that went in to this music? Because that's what the blues is about, the personal hardships. Musical features, it has a very simple A-A-B form. 12 measures, three sections, four measures each. A, then it literally repeats itself, your second A, and then B. And particularly in the blues, the A will repeat itself, and it'll be like a problem, and then the B section will be just sort of the way you deal with that problem. Oh, I'm doing online lecturing, and it's not going so well. That's my A. Oh, yeah, I'm doing some online lecturing, and it's not going so well because my Internet's all poopy. That's my second A. So I'm going to call up that Internet man, and I'm going to tell him to take his connection and take it to, oh, yeah. That's my B, right? Response, A, A, B. Of course, we put it in a more musical context and um, actually get some professionals in here to take care of that. You have your typical blues. Famous blues musicians, we have Bessie Smith here, um, hugely famous, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, um, b -b 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 Big Mama Thornton, another famous blues singers, right? A lot of female musicians became well-known. A lot of female singers came out of this. Again, Bessie Smith, Big Mama Thornton, Ruth Brown, um, all these sorts of sorts of people. And the blues itself turned into jazz, turned into swing. And so it all started with the blues. Usually the blues was done by one person. Um, and usually that person played the guitar. Famous guitar blues musicians, uh, Robert Johnson. Uh, another one of those Faustian stories. People say Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. Famous for his song, The Crossroads, uh, as covered by Eric Clapton. So, lots of listening to do for the blues. Of course, that turns into the Chicago electric blues. It moves up the Mississippi. People like Muddy Waters. Uh, again, tons of things to look at in this, in this genre. 
beginning of jazz. Ah. Jazz was not written down at the onset of it. It first appeared in New Orleans funeral bands. In New Orleans, uh, the Creole culture, which is partially based on French culture, for funerals, they would just have a big brass band and a procession down the streets. They still do it. If you go to New Orleans, they still have these old-school Dixieland funeral processions. Um so it's, again, these big brass instruments, trumpets, tubas, trombones, that sort of thing. Combine that with the blues, and we're going to get the onset of jazz. Elements of jazz, it has uh, usually a very strict melody. We call it a head, and it's often repeated, right? Jazz tunes generally have one melody for an A, one melody for a B, but mostly they're concerned with improvisation. Um, the melodies themselves are strict. The improvisation aspect of it is not very strict. Harmony, generally jazz has very set harmonies. Um, we have this set of changes called the jazz progression, but if you ever play with the jazz group, you are always expected to know the chord changes. You are always expected to know how the harmony changes. So we actually have these books and sheet music to help us do that. Uh, we call them lead sheets, very similar to what we talked about with the broadsides, which were essentially just the music lyrics. For jazz, you would just get a set of the rhythm changes. And rhythm, rhythm is generally very free. For smaller bands, you'll notice with this band we have at least four woodwind instrument players. Anytime they're playing in unison, it always has to be directly in unison. So again, when we talk about melody in jazz, the melodies are very strict, but the improvisation is very free. The rhythm in jazz, if you're playing with people, it's very strict. If you're playing by yourself, it's very free. Um, please do be sure all of these PowerPoints are posted in Georgia View. Remember to read what the publisher put on the PowerPoints. A lot of that pertaining to what is on the slides is very important to study as well. Timbre in jazz. You'll notice we have a drum set player over here. Generally, there's a piano player and a string bass player, not an electric bass. And then as far as wind instrument goes, you can have the whole gamut. Flutes, clarinets, uh, saxophones, trumpets, trombones, as I mentioned, tubas, because it does come from that New Orleans style. And then for jazz, you don't get a lot of string instruments. But for big band, sometimes you'll get small string sections with those. Um, Benny Goodman's band, I believe, used... Uh, a full string section. Gene Krupa's band, I believe, used a smaller string section. And again, these are just uh, famous band leaders in the swing era. Stuff worth checking out, absolutely. And then, of course, jazz starts early in the 1900s, and it develops up into and through the 70s and 80s with bebop, uh, with hard bop. But early on, we have Dixieland jazz, made famous by Louis Armstrong, Boogie Woogie, and the piano style of someone like um, Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan had a very, very Boogie Woogie style to him. And then straight swing like Duke Ellington and his famous Take the A Train. Again, I would show Take the A Train right now. But we are having still those technical difficulties, right? Take the A-Train. Might we do it? Look at that red bar go. It's really interested. It's not happening. Man, have you heard about those people who are doing, like, marble racing? We have no sports. I actually watched some Japanese beetle fighting the other day. Um, that's really keeping me interested. I might, I might do some of that later today. So, but... Between watching your Japanese beetle fights, go and listen to some Duke Ellington. Go listen to some Louis Armstrong. Bessie Smith and uh, Robert Johnson to catch your blues. Scott Joplin to check out your ragtime. Right? Lecture's going to end a little early today. It is your responsibility to look up these musical examples and listen to them. Familiarize yourself with them.
Tin Pan Alley, my favorite Tin Pan Alley tune is uh, Gene Autry, My Blue Heaven. Check out that one, too. Okay. Again, be sure to be reading these PowerPoints. Be sure to be looking at the for study guide, which is also posted on Georgia View. Email me if you have any questions. We're going to move on to dun, 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 chapter 38. Popular music since 1950. Perhaps the easiest chapter, particularly for me, since it's what I was raised with, but there might be some that you know in here, too. So, changes in social setting. Population has almost tripled since 1950, right? We were involved in that little World War II thing, right? That tiny little scrap. Um, and we have that baby boom, right? We have all of those boomers running around nowadays ruining our economy and all that good stuff. Uh, that was just after World War II. Husbands came home from war, got to see their wives, who they were separated from for a long time, and, you know, nine months later. We have an increase in the economy of the United States, the rise of the American working middle class, and so this means more disposable income for your American middle class, invigorates the economy, also gives us more money to spend on things like popular music. The only reason that rock and roll could come to exist was the fact that there was this surplus of funding in the beginning of the 60s and the 50s in which people could spend on popular music. TV, boom, replaces the radio. Great, we love it. Now we have images, so we get great shows like American Bandstand and later on Soul Train. Radio is for specific things, specific markets, right? Again, we keep a lot of the country until, right? The Grand Old Opry, perfect example. Grand Old Opry was a radio show, not a television show, even though that technology was there. So again, the radio can still be used for some very specific markets. More diverse recording companies, right? Back in the day, we just had like a couple Particularly if you wanted to get, like, country music, you took a guy who was up in New York City, and he packs up his tape recorder set, and he drives down to the south, and he records a guy playing his banjo music, and then he drives back up to New York, and they mix and master it there. Now we start to get more recording companies around the entire United States. In particular, more representative recording companies. We have the Brill Building in New York City, which is mass-producing popular rock tunes. We have Barry Gordy and Motown Records in Detroit, the first black man to own his own recording company. Had famous people coming in there, the Jackson 5, Michael Jackson, Ray Charles, right? So we have all of these different... Um, Recording companies coming up that are appealing to different artists in different markets. And minorities become more conscious of their identity. Let's just say that that's sort of a constant in the American culture. Um, and particularly with the social movements of people like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and then even into the music James Brown, right? It's James Brown's popular tagline say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, taking a hold of his identity and really using it as a tool. Um, again, James Brown, soul brother number one, as he's called. He could not be who he was without accepting and reveling in the fact that he is a black man. It's great. Celebration of that identity is really exciting. Speaking of blues and soul music, again, this is music that was essentially taken from Africa. It came over, the, the musical traditions of the African people came over on the slave ships and was suppressed for that period of slavery. However, that meant they kept their musical traditions alive in the ways they can. Remember, a lot of times they couldn't make music because some slave owners wouldn't like it, um, wouldn't allow it. But they did what they can, particularly with religion, right? A lot of these um, old hymns, old church hymns, and we get have a rich collection of work songs. And so all of this transforms over time to become the blues and soul music. 
uh, particularly around the 1950s, 1960s. Here we have uh, bu -bu 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 Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, famous, famous black guitarist, right? Uh, he has that great scene in Back to the Future, him playing Johnny B. Good, right? Interesting story. What we had in these days was segregated popular boards, right? The Billboard number one charts. We had the blues and soul category. So although, um, although Chuck Berry identified as a rock musician, he had to appear on the blues and soul board because he was black. The first ever single that Chuck Berry gets on the rock is a little ditty called My Dingaling, which is about a tiny little bell but you can hear the double entendre there. There's a great recording of him doing it live on YouTube. I highly suggest you check it out. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of cultural identity things going on in the music world right now. Um, and it just gets us so much cool music, blues, funk, soul, great stuff, just great stuff. Country music was around too. It was the music of the Southern white population. Sung in a plain style which must sin much sincerity, accompanied by guitars and fiddles, simple melodies, harmonies, and rhythm. Texts are realistic and often sentimental. We see a lot of parallels between the blues style and the country music style, actually. They're analogous in almost every way except who's playing them and how they're put together, right? Oftentimes the instruments are the same. The simple melodies and harmonies are the same. And the fact that it's usually a single person thing is the same. Uh, so we do have this great analogy between the blues and country music. One of those most famous country musicians, this tall drink of water here, Hank Williams. And again, one of those, he sort of represents that white hat, uh, good boy country look to him, doesn't he? Doesn't he just look like the sort of person who will hold that saloon door open for his missus? He sure does. Uh, radio is important in the early development of country music, right? Because if you think of the population that it's trying to appeal to, it's the more down-home farm worker style, right? And so the radio is a better way to get that to, to the lower middle class. Several stars later sold millions of recordings. Again, Hank Williams, Dolly Parton, um, leading up to what garth brooks he's one of those guys of course country music gets its offshoots country western rockabilly bluegrass um over in the uk we get skiffle uh good things like that so the genre itself diversifies we love it rock music combination of country and blues but often with messages of impatience with social norms Right? Rock music is the angry music of the young kids, right? What are we writing about? We're writing about things we know. Some of the earliest songs are about how much we hate school and don't want to be there. Uh, and then fast cars and pretty women. That's the, the typical rock song. One of the most famous ones, Rock Around the Clock, which is just about rock music, right? When the clock strikes one, two, and three, we'll be rocking in history or something like that. This is very, very funny, very frivolous music and lyrics just about having fun. Characteristics, there's a strong beat with a backbeat. Backbeat is that really... It's a very strong snare hit usually on two and four, right? One of my favorite examples to play for that is Dave Matthews' Ants Marching. Right, because it just starts off with that. Right, we call that a, a backbeat, and again, that's what the head's usually going to. Right, you listen to some AC/DC Metallica, you'll you'll catch that right away. Melody and harmony often use modes. It often uses modes or the pentatonic scales. Right, why? Because they're easy to play. They're easy to play, and they sound really good. A lot of rock music, early rock, particularly jam rock that uses a lot of improvisation, done in the modes. Again, because it's accessible, easy to play, and it sounds good. Timbre varies much with the type of rock. Yeah, particularly nowadays, but back in the day it was essentially drums, 
guitar, other guitar, bass, singer, right? Generally, the instrumentation is set, but with the electronic capabilities of instruments nowadays, the team can be different. For your lyrics and topics, we can make a rock song about anything, and believe you me, people like Prince did. Performance is often dazzling, yes. Uh, famously, Jimi Hendrix performing the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock. I believe it was 69. I think it was 60. It might have been 67. But where he plays it behind his back, plays it with his teeth, and then at the end lights it on fire. Uh, the Who, a British rock band, was famous for smashing their amplifiers with their guitars every uh, performance they finished. So performances I have a lot, of, lot to it. So as far as the divisions and types of rock, we just have tons, right? Um, it started off early. Uh, people like Elvis were what we call crossover musicians. Uh, Elvis was essentially a white man playing what was considered black music back in the day, singing uh, the blues and things like that. Uh, there were other musicians doing that. They're not as interesting as Elvis. Elvis is certainly the more popular. Um, then, of course, we get into psychedelic rock in the 60s. That leads to punk rock. That leads to progressive rock. That leads to acid rock. That leads to uh, metal. That leads to Seattle grunge rock, right? And, and on, on and on and on and on and on. There's a lot of different types of rock, okay? Uh, the British influence, back in the 60s, we had just this influx of British bands. We call it the British Invasion. That included the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the Who, po perhaps three of the most important. Folk rock is just a more down-home style. We can essentially combine country elements and put it into a, a rock style. Think the Lumineers. Um... Think uh, Sanford and Sons. No, no. What is that? Who, who am I thinking of? You know who I'm thinking of. Is it, It's not Sanford and Sons. That's a television. Mumford and Sons. Mumford and Sons. That's the one. Folk rock. Okay. The fusion style, right? That's um, combining different sorts of music styles, right? Let me put punk rock in with progressive rock and see what I get. Fusion can apply to any number of, of genres. Satire and punk rock. Punk was very simple and very relatable. It was a very socially driven music. Um, had a, a very do-it-yourself attitude. And of course, in 19, I believe it's 1983, we get the creation of MTV, music television, music videos, um, Video killed the radio star, perhaps one of the greatest examples of that, right? We can show it. No, look at that sad little guy having trouble finding that site. That's, he's very sad about it. That's okay. So go watch some music videos, particularly Video Killed the Radio Star, because I think it's hilarious. Other types of popular music, Latin American, salsa, and reggae, right? Salsa is from um, Central America. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on which country it is exactly from. Um, we also have Cuban music imported from Cuba, right? Tito Puente. Reggae, which is from Jamaica. Reggae, which led to ska. Um style called rock steady too he wasn't just a teenage mutant ninja turtles villain other popular music modern jazz bop funk uh we have dave brubeck who did the famous take five doing his rondo a la turk take a listen to that wenton marsalis actually prominent trumpet player and composer won an award this year very impressive go listen to some of him okay so that's your main popular music since 1950. There's a lot of it. A lot happened. Um, and in particular, this is one of the topics that I'm more passionate about. If you have any questions about this, would like any listening recommendations, please let me know. That is chapter 38. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Use the good, use the good format. And chapter 39. 
music for the stage and film. Okay. Again, this will be a shorter chapter because I will not be playing, be able to play listening examples. Again, I apologize for that. Uh, we might have one more day of this, but hopefully things will be better on Thursday. So, music for the stage. We were giving concerts, right? Remember we had talked about John Philip Sousa and his military bands? There were still military bands giving concerts. We started to have uh, symphonies established. I believe it's at the very end of the 1800s. Starts in Philadelphia, moves to New York, uh, New Jersey. But we do have classical music going on. We still do have concerts. Uh, we had minstrel shows, which is a very complex American tradition. Um, it's, it's essentially the idea of blackface performers. It's a reappropriation of black culture for entertainment purposes. It is not pretty, but again, it does have historical importance, and it did lead to allowing black people to enter the entertainment industry eventually we stop doing blackface and we do have actual black performers doing minstrel shows presenting authentic african-american tradition um so it's it's again it's a very strange and complicated topic um that deserves more of a discussion than i can give it right now we also had vaudevilles, which were essentially talent shows. Anyone could enter. You could see a ventriloquist followed by a juggler, followed by a guy with a dancing bear in a tutu. Right? Anything could happen at these vaudeville shows. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize. Um, so again, they were they were these talent shows that where you could see anything, anyone performing anything. So it was a good cultural mix too. Operettas were essentially one-act small operas, just very short vignettes that people could put on. And I believe we're all familiar with the Broadway, the idea of the Broadway musical as represented by Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera over here. Of course, we just had the re-release of Cats, which uh, I am told did not go great. But um, that is another example. I believe that's Andrew Lloyd Webber as well. Um, and that is a Broadway musical adapted to film. One Broadway musical that we're going to talk about is West Side Story by Leonard Bernstein. Now, what Leonard Bernstein, sti Bernstein did was he recreated Romeo and Juliet. Um, but instead of the Capulets and the Montagues, we have the Sharks and the Jets. Uh, the Sharks and Jets are the Sharks are a Puerto Rican gang and the Jets are a bunch of white guys and so the whole thing is them butting heads this entire time um, Tony is in the Jets he's a native New Yorker and he's in love with Maria who is a Puerto Rican so that is your Romeo and Juliet they fall in love Anita is a comedic relief character right she plays the nurse of Juliet and this quintet it's actually told from five viewpoints right we have the sharks who are going to sing the jets who are going to sing Tony Maria and Anita who is essentially talking about how much fun she's going to have uh, meeting all the pretty boys at the dance right this is essentially them singing about going to a dance and like having a big dance off with each other. Um, and of course, Tony and Maria are getting to sing about seeing each other, and Anita is getting to see sing about seeing all the pretty boys. Um, so it's a quintet. They use the same theme, and they each sings their own little part, and it goes between them. It's very good. Um, please go watch the entire movie. It's really good. Um, Leonard Bernstein, perhaps one of the most important music conductors, composers, and educators of the late 20th century. He worked real hard with PBS to put on a series of music education programs for kids, as well as just being a really incredible conductor and composer, too. So um, go watch his West Side Story. 
and listen to the quintet. If you do nothing else, listen to the quintet. Amazing. It's great stuff. So <laughs> let's get away from the idea of the musical, right? Because we have musicals over here, which has spoken dialogue and is, is sort of less serious than opera. And then we have opera, which is all sung. And so then we have an operatic musical, which is going to be sort of in the middle here, right? Musicals have a very different singing style to them, too. So that's, that's another consideration of it. But we can have operatic musicals. So a lot of musicals are actually operas in which every word of them is sung. Remember that that is a caveat of opera, is every word is sung. But some are going to use a singing style similar to musicals. Sometimes we're going to use amplification. Oftentimes, opera singers, no amplification, except for, like, the massive halls. But um, In musicals, a lot of times the singers are mic'd. The singing roles are not as demanding. A lot of technical, uh, technical prowess is required in opera. Less is required in musicals. Not saying it's not hard. It's just less technically demanding. Uh, these are going to be sung in English. The action is going to move quickly. And, of course, we're going to include a few humorous songs, even if we do have a sad topic like what we're going to look at. Uh, American opera never got that popular in Europe, but we have some good stuff. Like We have some really good stuff. In particular, George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. We call it a folk opera because it touches on the ideas of folk traditions, right? Remember when we talk about romantic Italian opera? We called it verissimo because it talked about normal people. We're going to call this folk opera because it uses elements of American folk music, right? Um, and it uses a lot of topics, and it has to do with sort of the lower class of, of American civilization, too. Um, it uses jazz elements in it as well, which is, again, another one of those incorporations of an American tradition. And this is actually Bess singing to her baby at this time. Uh, summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Now, one thing to note is you may have heard this little tune before, um, perhaps covered by a group you might know as Sublime. Yes, it is the same song. Um, but that was originally done by this guy, George Gershwin, in his folk opera, Porky and Bess. Please do yourselves a favor and listen to that. There is a wonderful live recording on YouTube. Music for films, what does it do? Well, obviously, a film's got to have music, right? It provides atmosphere. It gives us introspection on the characters. It builds continuity, and it helps let us know when the action is beginning and where is it going. Is this scene finished? Should I be expecting anything? Is there suspense? Is that person a hero or a villain? I can't tell. He has a cape on. Capes are so ambiguous. Is it a good cape or a bad cape? Ah, listen to those majestic trombones. He's a good hero, right? Music can do a lot for us. If you don't believe me, go listen to someone who recut Star Wars without the music. It's a very uh, sad thing. <laughs> Musical film. Remember, we used to have silent films, Charlie Chaplin, that sort of thing. Thing. We used to actually have live musicians to perform those uh, silent movies. They played music during the films. It's kind of great, uh, kind of really cool. But in 1927, we had the first of the talkies, as they were called, to the first film that had music and speech in it, like actual pre-recorded sound. Many excellent composers of film music exist, uh, in Asia, Tan Dune. In America, we have that uh, 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 John Williams, right? We've discussed some people who did film music. Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov. Um, he was one of the Russian Five. I just watched a Mystery Science Theater 3000 that uh, had a composition by 
a soundtrack by Nikolai Rinsky Korsakov. So, a lot of uh, classical music composers did film music too, and a lot of film music composers are just as good as classical music composers. So, if you've never seen the film Psycho, um, it is a thriller. It is very interesting with the crazy plot twist at the end. And the music is used for great dramatic effect. It's very difficult for me to even talk about a scene in which the music sets an ambiance for something. But I'm just going to tell you right now. Woman gets killed. Beep, 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 beep. If you ever heard someone do that, that's literally having to do with the soundtrack to Psycho. Check it out. It's very good, right? It's a very If you haven't seen the movie itself, it's a very good movie. Um, just one of the cinematic classics. Uh, do yourself a favor, though, and view the YouTube clips posted in Cengage. I will make sure to download video and audio for the lecture on next on Thursday, just in case I have to teach from this computer again. I do apologize for that today, but I believe I provided you with information to seek out the listening examples that you need. If you have any questions, please email me, and I can generate a list for you. Um, other than that, that's going to be everything for today. We're ending a half hour early to give you some time look up those audio clips. I will be around for at least the next half hour, and remember, you can always reach me by email or on Georgiaview, and I'll get back as quickly as possible. Uh, remember to confirm your paper topics if you haven't. Papers are going to be due very soon. Remember, you have your concert reports also due. All of those due dates and uploads are done through Georgiaview, so if you have any questions about that, let me know as well. Uh, that'll be all for today. Thank you, everyone, as we continue to go through online ed education in the spring of 2020. Hope you all have a good day, and we will see you on Thursday.